Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Critical Issues Forum online teachers workshop. Today's lecture is going to focus on the US Russia arms control and non proliferation cooperation. And I'm delighted to have Ms. Sarah Bitgood, the director of the Eurasian non proliferation program at the CNS. So, since I already introduced uh, Sarah to you in her previous lecture, uh, I'm not going to repeat it. But uh, this area is her real expertise, so we are so looking forward to uh, have, having your lecture. So, without further ado, I'm just going to give a microphone to you, Sarah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Masako. Thank you so much. And um, hello to everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be joining you again and to, as Masako said, talk about um, the area that I really feel like is my, my primary uh, research focus. So um, uh, as Masako mentioned, we'll be focusing today on US-Russia arms control and cooperation for non-proliferation. And this is actually the focus of um, a book that uh, my, our center director, Bill Potter, and I brought out last year that looks at the history of U.S.-Soviet non-proliferation cooperation and tries this, there it is, Masako has it, and tries to derive some lessons from that history that we can um, apply today. And um, a couple of the things that I hope to sort of highlight over the next, you know, half hour or so are really that the United States and, and the Russian Federation and the Soviet Union did have a very rich tradition of cooperating on nuclear issues, even when the overarching sort of high political environment wasn't really conducive to this type of work. And I think that there is a misperception today that um, the US and Russia have an adversarial relationship across all domains, including sensitive nuclear domains, uh, and that that must be the case, and that has always been the case, and that's not really true. So some of the things that I hope to highlight here are um, counter examples to that narrative that I think we would do well to revisit um, today. So, okay, without further ado, let me, oops, move to my next slide here if I can. I'll try the clicker down here. Okay, <clears throat> so here's a roadmap of, of what I hope we can look at for today. Um, we've already talked about mutually assured destruction, so I probably won't dwell too much on that, but just as a way of kind of laying the groundwork for what the motivation was behind of this, a lot of this cooperation. Um, we'll also talk, touch briefly on the Cuban Missile Crisis, although I know that's a history that, that everyone who's listening knows very well. Um, and then I'm going to go through some of these examples of US-Soviet cooperation for non-proliferation. So we'll look at the non-proliferation treaty, which is something I talked about a couple of days ago. Um, we'll talk about export controls, which mean you know, making sure that the export of nuclear material or nuclear equipment isn't misused for military purposes. We'll talk about limits on testing. And again, this sort of ties back into our previous conversation about the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. We'll talk a little bit about the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, which um, began after the, um, after the Soviet Union dissolved and ended in about you know, 2013, as far as US-Russia cooperation went. We'll talk a little bit about the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, although um, unfortunately there's not a lot of, to say about that at the moment. And uh, we'll look at a couple of others as well. And then the goal will be to kind of identify what made this cooperation work um, and uh, what happened and what we can do from here. So um, again, just to revisit and kind of um, reestablish some of what I said in the lecture a couple of days ago, the idea of mutually assured destruction um, really came about sort of after the United States uh, first used a nuclear weapon and after the Soviet Union tested. Um, and there, there is a, the way that the, the sort of um, nuclear enterprise in the United States developed meant that there was a very big emphasis on ground-based missiles that were tipped with nuclear warheads. And so those are based, you know, all around the Midwest and they're not mobile, they're located in the ground. And if your enemy figures out where those missiles are located, that means that you're very vulnerable to a first strike um, attack. And so some of the result of that is that um, the United States and the Soviet Union very quickly realized that they needed to be able to develop a credible second strike capability. So as I mentioned in the previous lecture, that really means um, the being assured that if your um, 
uh, ground-based missiles or your most vulnerable nuclear assets or your you know, um, decision-making structure are taken out by a first strike, you still have the means to retaliate in a way that would be really devastating to your enemy. And so um, the United States and the Soviet Union devoted a great deal of time and attention to developing um, the capability to launch a massive retaliatory strike. And that is really what fomented this idea of, of mutually assured destruction. Of course, the challenge and the, the kind of um, lasting legacy of this is that mutually assured destruction really means you need to have a lot of missiles, a lot of warheads, a lot of aircraft that can carry nuclear weapons, a lot of submarines that can carry and launch um, uh, you know, nuclear tipped missiles. And um, that means that there's just a huge buildup of, of nuclear arms. And so that really got us to a point at sort of the height of the Cold War where we had many, 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 many times uh, more weapons than we would need to you know, destroy the earth multiple times over. Um, and so that led to the kind of arms racing that really precipitated um, the need for nuclear arms control and created an environment where both sides both the United States and the, and the Soviet Union recognized that this was madness and that you know, some, something needed to be done um, to, to start to reverse the, the arms race that had been fomented as a result of mutually assured um, destruction. So of course, you know, uh, there are many different images that you can use to illustrate mad, but I really like the, the, this still from Dr. Strangelove because I think in a lot of ways, the sort of um, absurdity of that movie and the the you know, black humor of that movie illustrates the um, real kind of logical fallacies that underpinned the idea of MAD um, and that led to an environment where both the United States and the Soviet Union were just developing so many more weapons than they could ever possibly need, um, which is the legacy that we're living with um, today. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Um, so as I sort of alluded to, you know, this had a lasting legacy um, in both the United States and the Soviet Union that have had a, a really long-term impact on international peace and security and has given rise in many ways to the challenges that we're still dealing with today in the nuclear space. Um, so there was a significant increase in nuclear testing. Um, and there's a YouTube video here, and, and I'm happy to sort of give Masako my slides, and she may have showed you this already before, but it, um, it really, it's a sort of artist's rendering of the way that testing escalated over time as, you know, not only the United States and the Soviet Union started arms racing, but other countries got involved as well as their threat perceptions changed. So that really created an environment where um, nuclear testing was very widespread and uh, including atmospheric testing, which of course is, you know, creates fallout and is, is very bad for the environment and for people. So that was part of the, the kind of legacy of this arms racing. Um, of course, there was a buildup of arsenals as well. That's the, the whole idea behind arms racing. And with that came a lot of really close calls that we're starting to learn more about today. Um, so I think there is a misperception that um, you know, nuclear weapons, because they've only been used one time in war, are somehow um, you know, don't really need to occupy a, a primary spot in our brain when we think about what the biggest threats are to humanity. I know that you all don't think that otherwise you wouldn't be participating in this program, but um, if we knew more about the huge number of, of, um, of times when either the United States or the Soviet Union came very close to accidentally or deliberately using a nuclear weapon, you know, I think we would really significantly revise our, our view on, on um, whether these, these weapons are kind of safe or secure or whether they don't need to be at the forefront of our minds. Um, so thanks to you know, the declassification of, of um, lots of parts of our nuclear history in both the United States and the Soviet Union, I think we're learning more and more about um, you know, different moments where um, people either in Russia or, in, or rather in the Soviet Union or in the United States had to make split second decisions about whether they thought they really were under attack and whether they should launch a retaliatory strike or not. And that history is worth reviewing because um, I think it highlights the importance of nuclear risk reduction um, even today. And so there are you know, numerous examples of this one movie that 
I've seen recently that I really loved is called Command and Control. And I think you can watch it on PBS, but I'd highly recommend it because it sort of shows how, um, you know, accidents, very, very small accidents can precipitate a near nuclear disaster. And those aren't stories that we hear unless somebody tells them. And that is a, a story that's told in a very compelling way. Um, so at the same time that you kind of have this military arms racing going on as a result of mutually assured destruction and this, uh, you know, nuclear buildup, you also have um, sort of a peaceful nuclear race happening at the same time. So um, as you know, in 1953, Eisenhower sort of debuted this idea of atoms for peace at the United Nations General Assembly. So he was talking about, you know, um, the not just the military applications of, of the atom, but um, the atom as used for generating nuclear energy and producing radioisotopes that could be useful for medicine and, um, and you know, all, all kinds of sort of civil applications that, uh, that had not up until this point really been explored. And very quickly, the Soviet Union and the United States um, uh, got into kind of a, a nuclear peace race where they were both really rushing to export nuclear reactors to third parties um, and not really paying very close attention to what the proliferation consequences of these practices could be. So, um, you know, the United States, this was still at the period of time when um, the U.S. and the Soviet Union were sort of dividing up the world into, um, you know, the communist bloc and then U.S. allies. And so the United States would sort of export um, nuclear research reactors with very few assurances that they would be used for peaceful purposes to uh, non-aligned countries in an effort to get them to, you know, ally with the United States rather than going with the communist bloc. And um, this had really serious consequences in some cases. So for example, you know, the Soviet Union um, did provide a great deal of nuclear help to China and then China tested a nuclear weapon. Um, the same thing happened with the United States and India. So the United States and Canada were exporting what they thought was peaceful nuclear technology to India. And then in 1974, India was able to, you know, use the plutonium that it had generated um, through running its research reactor um, with, which was a heavy water research reactor to um, conduct what it referred to as a peaceful nuclear explosion, which is really just um, another name for a nuclear test explosion. Um, and something similar happened to the United States uh, with South Africa as well. South Africa is one of only a handful of countries that had a nuclear weapons program and then dismantled it and joined the non-proliferation treaty uh, in the 90s as a non-nuclear weapons state. So these were real kind of wake up calls to both the United States and the Soviet Union that put a bit of a damper on this nuclear peace race that initially had seemed like such a good sort of way of spreading American and Soviet foreign policy around uh, the world. And it also led to fears that other countries would proliferate too, um, including um, you know, Germany and, uh, and some of the ones, Japan, some of the countries that would kind of, I think, surprise us a little bit um, today. So, all of this, I'm kind of laying the groundwork for an environment where, where arms control was really necessary and export controls and non-proliferation controls were really necessary. But um, as with many things, it takes a, a significant crisis to actually get people to change their minds and to realize, whoa, we need to really put on the brakes. And the example that, that everyone always points to, and I think this is correct, is, is the Cuban Missile Crisis. So um, I know I don't need to explain the history of the Cuban Missile Crisis to you, but um, you know, just as a kind of a reminder, this was a, an extremely close call. And uh, we now know from the declassified record that the United States and the Soviet Union in particular came closer than I think any of us who have studied this history in the past, you know, several decades realized to using nuclear weapons. So there is a, a really interesting um, story that is now in the declassified record about some Soviet uh, submariners who were in uh, a submarine um, during the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis around Cuba. And when the United States started um, 
when, when it seemed as though the United States was possibly attacking them when really they were just trying to get the submarines to, to come up to the surface so they could see where they were, um, the submariners on this ship had to make a decision about whether they were going to fire a nuclear tipped uh, uh, torpedo. And their, the rule in the Soviet you know, command and control structure was that there were three people who needed to agree uh, in order to use a, a nuclear torpedo and in order to launch a nuclear torpedo. And two of these individuals who were, you know, responsible for decision making on this boat said, yes, I think this is, you know, the end times are nigh. We need to use um, our, our nuclear torpedo and we should launch it and this is the right thing to do. And it was one person on, on the submarine who said, I really don't think that we're under a nuclear attack and I don't actually think that we should use this torpedo. And so he is the person who was sort of standing between um, perhaps this, you know, second only use of nuclear weapons in, in a military conflict and, and their non-use. So again, that's just highlighting um, how close we came and how close the Cuban Missile Crisis was to precipitating the use of nuclear weapons. And it, get back, it gets back to the point that I made earlier uh, that um, the declassified record is now helping us better understand how dangerous um, these weapons really are when there is no trust between, um, you know, the nuclear powers as there was not in the Cuban Missile Crisis. So that really scared both, you know, the decision makers in the Soviet Union and in the United States. And part of what that precipitated was non-proliferation cooperation uh, and arms control. So um, that was really the kind of wake up call that both governments needed to realize, whoa, you know, mutually assured destruction and the sort of unfettered buildup of arms is not sustainable. And we need to do something, even if the problems in our relationship are, are too big for us to ever really become partners, we need to do something to um, reduce these risks and, and engage in closer cooperation, at least in the nuclear policy space. So, um, this is just to kind of recap um, a little bit about the, the different um, um, eras in U.S. and Soviet nuclear policy. And one of the things that I think is really remarkable is that there actually is a very close degree of alignment between um, the policies that the two sides were espousing, even though they did have very different um, kind of perspectives on, on other issues outside of the nuclear space. So there was this period of, of secrecy and denial in both the United States and the Soviet Union in the early part of kind of the nuclear atomic age, um, where, you know, both sides were competing with one another to see who could develop the bomb fastest. There was a lot of atomic espionage, nuclear espionage, which we, you know, know about um, um, today. And this period really went from about 1945 until 1953 or 1954. Then there was this Adams for Peace era that I mentioned a moment ago. Um, in the United States, this went on quite a bit longer than it did in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union very quickly, I think, realized when China tested that, wow, there are some serious proliferation consequences to just exporting nuclear material and nuclear equipment with only political assurances that the recipient country wasn't going to you know, use these for nefarious purposes. Uh, but in the United States, it took up until India tested in 1974 for them to kind of have that wake up moment. Um, then there was a period of technology control in both countries where um, both the United States and the Soviet Union decided that they needed to pretty carefully regulate to whom they exported nuclear technology and material and that they needed to coordinate their own policies when it came to nuclear export to avoid um, giving one another an advantage um, on the commercial market. And so that, that period in the United States went from 74 until 80, and in the Soviet Union, it went from about 1959 until 1986. And then there was this primacy of politics where, again, you see, you know, sort of the, the two sides pull back from cooperation in some respects and um, start to put the emphasis on, on their own um, global policies and politics rather than the need to cooperate in this very important issue that had previously been sort of sacrosanct. Um, so this is, again, just a list of, you know, sort of U.S.-Soviet and U.S.-Russian arms control agreements. 
And uh, one of the things, you know, this is a, a lengthy list, but one of the things that I think is particularly interesting to notice now is that um, these have really been in place for, you know, almost 50 years. And we're now kind of reaching a period of time where we could have no arms control agreements in place between the United States and the Russian Federation for the first time in five decades. And we don't really know, you know, what, um, what that will look like. The world is very different and technology is very different than it was 50 years ago. And uh, one of the things that really concerns people who kind of work on, um, on US-Russia issues is, you know, how uh, what is going to happen if, if once we enter a post arms control world, if that is indeed what happens and what does the future of arms control um, look like for the two sides. So, of course, um, you know, as we've mentioned previously, the INF Treaty, which was uh, uh, entered into force in 1987, that ended this year. So the US um, believes that Russia violated the treaty and uh, rather than utilizing the special verification commission that is established under that treaty to kind of resolve these concerns, um, the Trump administration decided that it was in its interest to withdraw from the treaty. And then of course, Russia did the same thing. So the treaty ended um, after a kind of six month um, period where they, they could have made an effort to, to, uh, to resolve their issues um, in August of 2019. So that, that treaty is no longer. And um, the New START Treaty, you can see here, is set to expire in February of 2021, which is really coming up uh, very, very soon. Um, and uh, there is an option, as I mentioned a couple of days ago, to extend the treaty for up to a period of five years. All it would require would be for Trump and Putin to say that they wanted to do that. It's not something that needs to be ratified in the Senate or in the Duma on the Russian side, which makes it um, to my mind, sort of a no-brainer. Um, and even though both the United States and the Russian Federation have already hit the, the um, limits that are mandated under New START, so this wouldn't, you know, extending the treaty wouldn't kind of um, uh, create an incentive for any deeper cuts, it would keep the number of, of uh, deployed warheads and deployed delivery systems that the two sides can have uh, at a particular level and in an environment where we could see a return to nuclear arms racing, I think having that limit in place is really important. And it just buys us a little bit of time to negotiate a follow on agreement um, rather than needing to do so, you know, right now, these agreements take time and, and this would, um, extending the treaty would let us uh, have a little window in which to, to do that. Um, so, I spent a lot of time a couple of days ago talking about the non-proliferation treaty. And the point that I wanna drive home here is that, you know, this is the cornerstone of the non-proliferation regime. It is the thing that kind of lays the foundation for many of the other bilateral and multilateral agreements and negotiations that have followed on since. And it was the product of US-Soviet cooperation. Um, so uh, there are three depository states who are sort of the keepers of the non-proliferation treaty, which are the US, the USSR, and the United Kingdom. But really, it came down to very close negotiation and agreement on the part of the US and the USSR in order to get conclusion uh, on, on this treaty. Um, and so a real breakthrough came in 1967 when um, both sides tabled identical drafts of a treaty at the open-ended working group that the UN had uh, put into place to negotiate this particular agreement. And it kind of left some open spaces for the two sides to negotiate on issues like safeguards, which are the, the agreements that NPT states parties need to conclude with the International Atomic Energy Agency to make sure that they're not diverting their peaceful material for military purposes. But by and large, the framework was agreed to by the US and the USSR. And that is what then allowed the treaty to open for signature in 1968. Um, so uh, many of us at CNS go to the review conferences and the preparatory committee meetings for the non-proliferation treaty, which happen basically on an annual basis. 
And it has been really striking to see the degree to which the US and the, so and the Russian Federation are no longer kind of cooperating in this setting. So it used to be the case, um, you know, a decade ago or many decades ago that the United States and the Soviet Union or the Russian Federation would sort of decide what their positions were gonna be together and then represent a united front to the rest of the NPT states parties. And that really is very noticeable the degree to which that's no longer happening. So um, now you'll hear both the Russian delegation and the American delegation um, ask for the floor at the end of every day and they'll exchange rights of reply where they criticize one another's policies or they criticize things that the others have said. And that is a very unusual uh, departure from the past. And it's something that makes those of us who spend time thinking about the NPT very worried about what the future of that agreement uh, will look like. So that's something that we'll be keeping our eye on as we move to the next big review conference, uh, which will happen in New York next year. Um, another area that I think is really interesting is with respect to export controls. So I mentioned previously that um, the United States and the Soviet Union, particularly after India tested in 1974, realized that they really needed to um, kind of put an end user agreement in place when they exported nuclear technology to make sure that the recipient country wasn't going to say that they would use the technology for generating you know, power and then instead use it to make a bomb because there is a big um, intersection between um, you know, the uses of, of reactor technology. They can be used for peaceful purposes and they can be used for military purposes. So making sure that they stay on the civil side became a big priority for the US and the Russian Federation and the Soviet and the Soviet Union. Um, so one of the chapters that I look at in the, the book that Masako showed the cover of earlier is the is um, looking at the negotiating history that led to something called um, the Nuclear Suppliers Group, which is still in existence today. So um, I used a lot of declassified documents and newly digitized documents from, from, uh, from the documentary record in the US to gain insights into what the motivations were for the US and the Soviet Union to um, try to create a group of major exporters who could coordinate their export control policies to prevent uh, non-nuclear weapon states from becoming nuclear weapon states. And it's really interesting to, to kind of look at the degree to which um, US decision makers regarded the Soviet Union as very much on the same page when it came to nuclear export policies. So, um, you know, this is a document here that I'm showing on the screen that's from Winston Lord and Freddie Clay. They wrote it for Henry Kissinger. And he had asked them to go out and, and analyze um, a possible approach to get the Soviet Union to be on board with respect to concluding some and coordinating their, their safeguards agreements. And um, it says in the document very clearly that there are no um, areas in which the Soviet Union has a less rigorous export, unilateral export control policy than the United States does. And so that made uh, Winston Lord and Freddie Clay pretty certain that the Soviet Union would be interested in partnering with them on this initiative. And another one of the kind of revelatory things in this document is um, it makes reference to a, a previous attempt to coordinate export controls called the Zanger Committee. And in it, um, uh, Winston Lord and Freddie Clay recall that sometimes if the Soviet delegation wasn't able to come to a meeting of the Zanger Committee, the United States would actually represent their positions. And so that gives you a sense for how closely allied the US and the Soviet Union were on these particular issues. It's really hard to imagine today that if you know, the Russian Federation and the United States were going to a, a meeting about nuclear issues that the Russian Federation would say, hey, I can't come to the meeting today because I have a different appointment. Could you please share my talking points with the larger group? That's just not something I can even fathom happening, but that was the type of thing um, and the, the degree to which the US and the Soviet Union were able to cooperate um, on these particular issues. So another area where the US and the Soviet Union worked together very closely was on, on nuclear testing. 
And so um, the limited test ban treaty um, and the threshold test ban treaty were um, attempts to get both the United States and the Soviet Union to, that, you know, they sort of emerged out of recognition that, that uh, as long as testing was allowed, both sides would be able to continue to um, build up their nuclear arsenals with new types of weapons that require explosive testing. And so a key to kind of tamping down on the arms race was preventing uh, both sides from testing. And um, the, the sort of main point that I want to make here is that one of the real challenges when it comes to prohibiting testing is making sure that both sides feel comfortable that they would be able to detect cheating on the part of their partners. And um, so the US and the Soviet Union um, worked very closely together um, at several different junctures to conduct experiments where they would go to one another's test sites and, and, set, and try to set up equipment and determine um, how sensitive their seismic detection equipment was and make sure that they would in fact be able to detect uh, an explosion in a way that, that they felt secure um, relying upon um, in order to be able to ratify these treaties. And so um, even though the, the Threshold Test Ban Treaty and the Peaceful Nuclear Explosions Treaty were concluded in the 1970s, they didn't enter into force until significantly later because neither side really felt like their technology would be able to, to, um, to verify that the other side wasn't cheating. But once they were able to get the technology in place by working together to uh, feel comfortable verifying the treaty, they did so. Um, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty is more complicated because it's a multilateral agreement and it prohibits any kind of testing uh, that generates um, a nuclear yield. So um, unlike, you know, the Threshold Test Ban Treaty and the Peaceful Nuclear Explosions Treaty, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty uh, really needed to have a, a very significant international monitoring system regime that we looked at a couple of days ago. Um, to be able to verify compliance with the treaty. And it still hasn't entered into force. Um, the Russian Federation ratified it, but the United States has not yet ratified it. They signed it. Um, and if they were able to, uh, you know, find a way for the U.S. to ratify the treaty, I think that that would represent a really significant confidence building measure between the United States and Russia. So even though that might wouldn't automatically mean that the treaty would enter into force. Um, it would still, I think, significantly help to improve U.S.-Russia relations um, and could provide a platform for further technical cooperation uh, on the IMS that might help um, lead to other types of cooperation between the United States and the Russian Federation on a whole host of non-proliferation issues. Um, the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program, I'll just say a couple of words about this. This was a really important bipartisan effort um, by, by uh, Sam Nunn and Richard Luger, who were two U.S. Senators. And um, the objective was, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, to secure all of the, the nuclear weapons and material that were spread out all around the territory of the Soviet Union. And um, you can see that there were four goals of, of what is sometimes shorthand called the Non-Luger Agreement, which were to dismantle the Soviet weapons of mass destruction, to consolidate weapons and related technologies and infrastructure, to increase transparency and adherence to international standards, and to support defense and military cooperation to prevent proliferation. And so for a very long time after the collapse of the USSR, uh, Russian and American um, uh, technical experts, but also policymakers, worked very closely with one another to, for example, find um, jobs for, uh, you know, Soviet experts who had worked in the Russian um, WMD enterprise who were now um, struggling to pay their bills or to get a salary. And so the U.S. Uh, tried to find, you know, tried to help them find work to make sure that they wouldn't uh, have any, you know, incentive to sell their expertise to um, a third party who might be interested in developing nuclear weapons. Um, the program expired in 2013, and there are a lot of reasons why this was the case. Um, 
in, among the Russian Federation, there was a sense that the United States was, um, uh, you know, um, giving money with strings attached. So they would give the Russian Federation money to do certain things with respect to their nuclear enterprise. And Russia didn't really have a lot of say in what those things were. Um, there were also challenges from the fact that there would sometimes be American contractors who would go to work at sensitive Russian nuclear installations and they wouldn't have any liability if something went wrong. So there were these challenges that certainly needed to be um, addressed and worked out, but I think it is symptomatic of the overall downturn in U.S.-Russia relations that, that this agreement sunsetted rather than morphing into something um, that could have facilitated more U.S.-Russia cooperation on these issues um, uh, now. So um, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, as I sort of alluded to at the outset, there's not a lot to say here at the moment because the United States is, is no longer adhering to that agreement, but um, it was a very significant example of U.S.-Russian uh, cooperation on nonproliferation issues in a multilateral setting. And for a while, you know, post-2015, it really was one of the few examples that, um, that we could still point to in the nonproliferation community to say, see, the United States and Russia can really work together on these issues. And it's really unfortunate that, um, you know, that the United States is no longer adhering to the deal. We don't exactly know what is going to happen with respect to the future of the deal, but uh, we do know that Iran is slowly um, ratcheting back the degree to which they are adhering to its terms in hopes, so they say that, you know, the United States will um, rejoin the deal or that this will persuade um, the U.S. To, to start adhering to its terms again and to provide sanctions relief. So we'll see what happens here, but um, I think there might have been a moment where the Russian Federation could have made a compelling case for the U.S. to remain in the treaty and they could have sort of appealed to this um, importance of U.S.-Russian cooperation in this space. And I don't think that that argument holds a lot of water now for many U.S. decision makers. Um, so it's unfortunate that that is, is no longer an example we can point to. Um, okay, so these are just some examples. There are actually many more. And if you are interested in reading the book, you will you know, find out some, some other examples that you can um, examine as well. But um, there are a few lessons that I'll just briefly go over that I think allowed this type of cooperation to work. One is you know, human interaction. So um, we know from looking at the documentary record and from reading you know, people's individual notes and, um, and the sort of memoranda of different conversations that um, human trust and personal rapport made a really big difference when it came to um, negotiating cooperative agreements and implementing them. And so um, we, we recently saw the passing of, of a really prestigious, important uh, Soviet ambassador by the name of Roland Timurbayev who over the course of his career worked extremely closely with his American counterpart, George Bunn. And um, you can read in, in you know, their memoirs and their remembrances about one another that they really were friends and would go hiking together and that that was sometimes where they would hash out the important details of, of you know, things relating to the nonproliferation treaty um, or cooperative you know, exercises in the nonproliferation space. So it's really clear that having that personal rapport and having the opportunities to build it um, because you have so many frequent interactions was important to starting cooperation and keeping it going during tough times. Um, it's also clear from looking at, at the documents that both uh, the Soviet Union and the United States at this time in the past, you know, viewed um, cooperating on nonproliferation and nonproliferation writ large as uh, important and is something where their leadership could boost their image in the eyes of the rest of the world. So they thought it was a sort of positive attribute that made them look better to the rest of the international community to be seen as leading on nonproliferation issues. Um, I am not sure that that is uh, the case, particularly in the United States anymore, but um, in the Russian Federation either. So um, without that kind of self-interested motivation, um, it's hard to imagine how cooperation can really get back on track until that changes. 
There was also flexibility and a willingness to compromise on both sides. So um, I think, again, this ties back into the importance of human interaction. When you negotiate with somebody who you know really well, you know when they are honestly saying, this is my position and I won't be able to sell something different back home in the capital, and you believe them. Um, and that lets you, I think, be more flexible and be more inclined to compromise because you know that your interlocutor is an honest broker. Um, there were also a lot of technical issues that I think were easier to cooperate on. So I mentioned the you know various test ban treaties um, and the need to figure out some technical approaches to being able to verify that both sides were adhering to the terms of the treaty. Um, those kinds of deeply technical issues were sometimes easier to cooperate on than the high political issues where um, you know the negotiators would have to contend with the larger security environment. Um, and so that kind of allowed cooperation to continue going even when the political environment was really difficult. And there was also a more imminent nuclear threat. So I started by talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis, but really there was you know deep concern for much of the height of the Cold War that um, either the Soviet Union or the United States would launch a devastating nuclear attack. And I think that that um, created an impetus to figure out ways to cooperate on, on non-proliferation and arms control issues that people mistakenly feel that we don't have today. Um, and so I sometimes wonder whether it will take a big catastrophe like the Cuban Missile Crisis to again, wake people up to how close uh, we are to um, you know, nuclear use, whether it's on purpose or, or by mistake. Um, okay. So this is, I'll just sort of go over this very, very quickly because I don't want to take too much time. I want to leave time for questions. But, um, you know, I, many of these programs were successful, but um, they've sunsetted and that is both a result of the downturn in US-Russia relations and I think a contributor to it. So for example, um, you know, the annexation of, of Crimea in 2014 resulted in sanctions on the part of the United States on Russia. And as a result of those sanctions, um, you know, the US is not able to allocate funds to cooperate on certain technical activities with the Russian Federation anymore in the defense space. And that I think is something, so there are kind of some, you know, legislative barriers to restarting cooperation that um, would need to be addressed for cooperation to get back into full swing between the two countries. Um, and there's also the challenge, the ongoing challenge, which we're seeing play out in the United States of um, this, uh, these allegations of, you know, collusion and election interference um, in the 2016 election. And so I think there is fear among some in Washington of being perceived as being too close to the Russian Federation. And that puts a big damper on thinking creatively about ways to cooperate with your Russian counterparts on sensitive issues. And uh, until that um, atmosphere changes, I think it is going to be very difficult to kind of restart really ambitious cooperation on, on non-proliferation issues. Um, at the same time though, we're also seeing the arms control architecture fall apart, which I talked about in a previous slide. And what this means is that there are fewer opportunities for Russia and the United States to interact on nuclear issues. So for every arms control treaty, you have to exchange information, you have to have inspections, you have to um, you know, meet with your counterparts to talk about how the implementation of these treaties are going. And as you lose arms control agreements, you have fewer fora to talk to your um, counterparts in Russia or in the United States. And so I think that contributes to the diminishing of trust and personal rapport among the players. And that has an impact on um, the future of arms control. It, makes, it decreases the incentives um, to think big about what the next treaty could be and how we can continue this type of cooperation. Um, what now, uh, I, you know, it's really tough to say what could happen next. I've, I've you know, kind of mentioned some of the challenges that I see ahead. Um, the United States under the Trump administration seems to think that the, the you know, next 
um, I guess, frontier for arms control is to somehow engage China in these efforts. And we did talk about that a couple of days ago. Um, uh, I'm quite pessimistic that there's a lot of potential there. The Chinese have said very clearly that they have no interest in, you know, being part of, of um, uh, reducing the numbers of their nuclear weapons simply because there's such a huge discrepancy between what the US and Russia possess and what China possesses. Um, I, I think, I mean, I would hope that what happens next is that the United States and the Russian Federation agree to extend the New START Treaty. Um, that would at least buy us a little bit of time to start thinking creatively about uh, what could be next, what could follow on, how we could incorporate some of the new types of delivery systems that Russia is debuting um, into a future arms control agreement. Um, it could let us, you know, think a little bit about what, what the prospects look like for some types of asymmetric arms control where um, the two sides are perhaps limiting different capabilities or different numbers of weapons, but still addressing each other's um, threat perceptions. Um, but we're really running out of time. And so uh, the first step for me is to extend the New START Treaty, just to keep something in place, keep the conversation going, um, and then see where, where that leads. So um, if you're interested in this history, which you know, I find fascinating, um, there are a lot of really fantastic declassified U.S. documents that you can get from the um, State Department, the, the um, Department, the Office of the Historian of the State Department. These include the foreign relations of the United States documents, which used to only be accessible, you know, through physical copies, but you can now get them online. Um, there's also uh, the CIA reading room, which is really fascinating. It has a lot of, you know, um, declassified documents, and there are constantly more being added. Um, that can provide really interesting insights into how the U.S. was viewing um, the Soviet Union, what they knew about them, um, etc. There's also, this is some of my favorite stuff, cable traffic between the U.S. Department of State and different representatives around the world. So it might be, you know, um, somebody, the Secretary of State in Washington, D.C., cabling instructions to the U.S. representative to the International Atomic Energy Agency. And those would go back and forth every day, all day long. They really give you a sense for you know what the what negotiations looked like, what the to the minute perception of the Russian Federation or the Soviet Union was in the U.S. So I recommend checking those out. Um, on the Russian side, for Russian speakers, the Rosatom um, digital library is excellent. It it doesn't go up as recent as the U.S. documentary record does, but it's still really interesting, and you can access it uh, from your home. And then, of course, conducting interviews is always a great way to learn um, from many of the key players on both sides who are still living, you know, about uh, how they went about conducting these negotiations and what they learned. So I'm going to end here uh, and hand it back over to Masako. And if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, it was really uh, interesting, but mm -hmm. very alarming. So now we are all aware that uh, the situation between the United States and Russia are really difficult. Yeah. So uh, in your lecture, you mentioned that uh, there are many arms control treaties and they, you know, although the number of nuclear weapons are much, much higher than the one the currently uh, the recent uh, current uh, number, but uh, that at least during the Cold War there was some trust between these two countries. In your view, what's the main reason why these countries, why these two countries, started uh, distracting, distrusting each other? Oh gosh, that's a big question, Masako. Um, you know, in some respects, I think. Um, you know, it has to do with changes in the priorities of the different administrations. So, you know, for example, um, during Reagan, like the period of time when Reagan and Gorbachev were, um, were in power, um, they were both institutional advocates for arms control and for cooperation on nuclear issues. And they together built a relationship that allowed them to think really ambitiously about um, 
you know, getting rid of nuclear weapons. In fact, I was just rereading this fabulous book, The Dead Hand, that that talks about, you know, the sort of history of, of um, Reagan and Gorbachev's relationship and, and the what happened after the USSR collapsed. And um, in it, you can see that the two, those two individuals built a really solid kind of relationship that was based on trust and that that's what let them think big. Um, but under subsequent US administrations, you know, that hasn't always been the case. And um, I do think to some extent as the US kind of pulls back, particularly now from multilateral um, treaties in general, um, that does create mistrust in the relationship with, with Russia because um, Russia and other countries can't be certain that an agreement that the United States negotiates today will necessarily be upheld if, if somebody else is elected into office you know, four years later. Um, and so that is what we saw um, happen with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Obviously that was a little bit different. It wasn't a treaty that was ratified in the Senate, but that did seem like an example of really ambitious, you know, non-proliferation cooperation, and a great example of U.S.-Russian cooperation. And um, now that's not the U.S. position anymore. Um, and so I think changes like that um, create distrust um, among between the U.S. and and not only Russia but other players as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, do you think you can bring back your slides a little bit? Yes. Uh, you could uh, just uh, share. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. And could you go back to the uh, Senator Nan and uh, Lucas' mm -hmm. slide? Mm -hmm. Corporate, yeah, corporate yeah. threat reduction. So perhaps, uh, uh, in my view, compared to the other US Russia arms control treaties, this important initiative is maybe. Uh, less known by many people. Uh, I don't know, but um, I may be wrong. But uh, in you listed these four goals, and especially uh, this uh, consolidate weapons and uh, related technology infrastructure. Could you share how bad it was uh, right after the Cold War? You know, I understand there are lots of dangers uh, mm -hmm. of the sp spread of uh, nuclear materials and uh, nuclear weapons to the terrorist uh, groups. Yeah. So if you could uh, uh, briefly talk about it, that might be interesting. Sure. So um, there were sort of two big challenges that I think fall under this particular objective. And one of them is that in the Soviet Union, um, there were nuclear weapons and delivery systems on the territories of other uh, countries under the Soviet, that were part of the Soviet Union, so under different territories. And when the USSR collapsed, it, those countries inherited these huge numbers of nuclear weapons and delivery systems. And so, um, there was a, a really concerted effort on the part of the United States and the Russian Federation and, for example, the new government of Ukraine to um, encourage these countries that had inherited these capabilities to repatriate them to Russia and to give them up and to agree to accede to the non-proliferation treaty uh, as non-nuclear weapon states. And today, I think it sort of seems like, of course, that's a foregone conclusion, but during the time of those negotiations, it, that was not the case. It was um, really an open question as to whether um, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine, which were the three countries, would in fact agree to, to give up these capabilities. Um, and then, of course, there was the question of, you know, capabilities is one thing, but um, uh, there was also all of this fissile material, the material that you could use to make a nuclear weapon that was kind of spread around these different territories as well, and it hadn't necessarily been accounted for or tracked um, in the way that you might hope or expect or in the way that presumably the Russian Federation does today. Um, and so there's a really fascinating um, uh, story in this book, The Dead Hand, about something called Project Sapphire, where a huge amount of highly enriched uranium was discovered by um, an American representative in Kazakhstan, 
uh, just sitting in sort of a storage shed somewhere, um, totally unprotected. You know, it had a little padlock on the door, but that was really it. And uh, there was a very concerted effort on the part of the United States working with the government of Kazakhstan to get this material out into the United States and somewhere safe before it could be stolen or purchased um, by a nefarious actor who would want to use it for um, a nuclear program. And when you read about um, kind of the conditions of um, the Soviet nuclear enterprise and, and um, nuclear infrastructure at the time of the USSR's collapse and shortly thereafter, it's really striking um, to see sort of how uh, inadequate that infrastructure was. So sometimes, you know, people often talk about just sort of around a sensitive nuclear installation, there might be a fence that was falling down and maybe a lock that wasn't very secure. And so people could just come in and out and take these nuclear materials and sell them on the black market or use them for terroristic activities or whatever it is. And so the US and the Russian government, the nascent Russian government really understood that this was a huge priority and that securing these materials was something they needed to work on. And it provided lots of opportunities for you know, Russian and American scientists and um, policy implementers to work really closely together um, and kind of build the type of trust that you need to, to do that work. Great, thank you. So during that period, both the United States and the Russia very well aware of the importance of a non-proliferation cooperation. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like a very good old days. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah. And I also wanted to mention these two gentlemen. I mean, unfortunately, uh, Senator Luga passed away that last year. Yeah. But uh, both of them, uh, Senator Nunn is a, our center's international advisory board member, mm -hmm. advisory board member. <laughs> so just wanted yeah. to highlight that point. So uh, I also wanted to ask you the uh, like a NATO expansion uh, issue. How NATO, uh, you know, we often hear NATO expansion uh, uh, is a really, really uh, uh, threatening Russia and that is the, one of the main reason of the mistrust between these two countries and that leads to the many uh, negative uh, development. Yeah. So could you uh, share uh, your view on this matter, the NATO expansion and these countries deteriorating uh, status? Yeah, um, <clears throat> that's a great, it's a great question. And I think you're spot on Masako that that is something that contributed to the real deterioration of trust in that relationship. Um, so <clears throat> following the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was a period of time where you know, Russia and NATO were sort of more closely engaged. And NATO um, countries assured the Russian Federation that they wouldn't expand into kind of Russia's backyard um, in ways that I think they have subsequently uh, done. And that's part of the reason why Russia is very distrustful of NATO and why they, they regard that as extremely, you know, they regard NATO expansion as threatening and as something that they can't trust that NATO will not expand further into their backyard. Um, and this all really comes to a head when you start to talk about ballistic missile defense because ballistic missile defense is um, often kind of brought up by um, uh, Russian experts and Russian policymakers as the thing that they regard as, as the most destabilizing and threatening in their relationship with the United States. And there did used to be a treaty called the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Defense Treaty, that prohibited both sides from developing these technologies. And the US abrogated the treaty and did start to develop ballistic missile defense capabilities and that um, Russians still cite that as, you know, a, a real turning point in, in their relationship with the U.S. And the, the reason why this ties back into NATO is that um, uh, there are U.S. ballistic missile defense capabilities 
um, that are stationed very close to the Russian Federation. And Russia is always very worried that these could actually be used not for defense, but for offensive capabilities. So to launch intermediate range nuclear missiles. Um, and so this notion that the United States and NATO are sort of encroaching on Russian territory and boxing it in is something that you, that I often hear you know, Russian colleagues and other Russian experts express as the thing that they find the most threatening in their relationship with the US and the most destabilizing. And that is part of um, the conversation that I think contributed to um, uh, the collapse of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. So it's all sort of tied in and it's, it's complex, but um, you can really get a sense for why it's important to understand the other side's perceived threats because they don't necessarily resonate. You know, I don't have the same threat perception that a Russian expert would have. And so it's very important to be able to understand where they're coming from in order to come up with solutions that will address the things we perceive as, as the most challenging. Yeah, thank you so much for explaining that. So next question may be also maybe a big question and I really don't know if there is a, any answer, but you mentioned and uh, if uh, the New START Treaty is not uh, extended after the expiration of February 2021, there will be no more uh, arms control agreement between the two countries and this for the first time almost 50 years, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be really dangerous situation. So this means both countries have a basically free hand to expand their nuclear arsenals. So in your view, do you think they're after, for example, if uh, the New START Treaty is not extended, what's the nightmare scenario <laughs> you would like to foresee? Well, I wouldn't like to foresee it, Masako, but um, <clears throat> yes, right. So here, I, I think for me, the big worry is that, um, you know, the New START Treaty won't be extended. Um, we will lose on both sides our ability to verify that the other side is not building up their nuclear arsenals because we, we will lose our right to conduct these verification exercises. Um, we know that the Russian Federation is developing new types of delivery systems. We know that there are some on the US side, and I'm certain on the Russian side as well, who would be interested in developing new types of nuclear weapons that require explosive testing. The United States is not a party to the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. They've signed it, but they haven't ratified. I am afraid that they would could potentially pull out of the CTBT in the interest of being able to conduct explosive tests that would allow them to develop these new weapons. If they did that, I'm certain the Russian Federation would do the same thing. I think this could lead to an environment where there is the ability to develop new weapons and no lid on um, the types or numbers of weapons that they can develop. And that we'll just see a return to rampant arms racing that unlike during the Cold War, will involve China, it's going to involve other countries as well. It's not just going to be limited to the two superpowers. And that you'll see a lot of entanglement and a kind of simultaneous buildup of um, conventional uh, advanced systems as well. So it's not just going to be a nuclear arms race, it's going to be high precision conventional weapons as well, um, which could pull in India, it could pull in you know, a number of other countries. And so I think in this multipolar world in which we live, um, you, we will see something that um, looks in some ways like the Cold War, but is in fact much, much more complicated and much more dangerous because it involves all of these other actors and we don't have um, any of the instruments that we used to have at the height of the Cold War to keep this from spiraling uh, out of control. Okay, so I really do not want to end with a, a nightmare <laughs> scenario. So I want to ask you, this is a final question. So despite this uh, a very difficult situation, I am also aware that there are some initiatives uh, 
non-governmental initiative, like a track to initiative, and also like a, yeah, academia and uh, track 1.5 or track 2.5 or like mm -hmm. some, some initiative. And uh, I understand that uh, you yourself are involved in some initiative. So if you could uh, share that kind of initiative and also some, uh, I would like to end some positive note. So if you could. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you're exactly right. We do um, at CNS have a number of track one and a half and track two and track two and a half initiatives that are meant to bring together, you know, Russian and American experts to really talk about some of these complex issues. And um, sometimes they, you know, they focus around different topics. Sometimes they're focused narrowly on specific things like what is the future of arms control going to look like? And sometimes they're more about, you know, how do you facilitate closer cooperation between uh, Russia and the United States in the, in the NPT setting or something like that. Um, and for me, you know, I think they do several valuable things. Number one, um, they provide a channel for communicating about these issues that I don't, I don't think is being replicated on an official government to government level. So they fill a void that is, is left by um, the lack of official government to government and military mil to military communication between the US and Russia. But second, you know, they also um, provide opportunities for um, relationship building between Russian and American experts. So I have now been participating in some of these meetings since 2015. And over those nearly five years, I've built um, a sense of rapport with and a real understanding of what the perspectives are of my Russian colleagues. And that lets me, when I'm doing my work, which is mostly aimed at trying to make recommendations to policymakers, I really have a deep understanding of, of what, it, what the issues are that my Russian colleagues are concerned about. And that's something that you just can't get if you're not having face-to-face -face communication with people. And then the third thing I'll say, which I, I think may resonate with, with you know, our audience here, is um, a lot of our initiatives are aimed at facilitating closer engagement and friendships with um, students on the Russian and the American side. So as you know, we have a, a dual degree program where students um, graduate with a master's degree from Miki Mall in Russia and also with a master's degree from the Middlebury Institute here and they spend time at both institutions. And um, those are the people who are going to hopefully, you know, become future government officials and future decision makers. And if they have a personal sense of rapport and trust with their colleagues, you know, in the other country, I think that's um, it's a bit of a long game, but that's the kind of thing that can really make a difference in U.S.-Russia relations. Um, and so we're trying to kind of lay the groundwork for that now. Okay, thank you. Uh, so on that positive note <laughs> and encouraging statement, I really hope that uh, CIF students, you know, U.S.-Russia and the Japanese students, especially U.S. and Russian students are really, really interested in, in this topic. So we continue to uh, you know, provide useful information and uh, education and people-to-people uh, -people diplomacy, diplomacy is really important in the long term. Maybe it may be difficult to see the short-term solution, but that's why we really uh, believe that the youth education is so important for the uh, you know, to have a more peaceful and secure world. So thank you so much, Sarah. And it was a really interesting top, uh, lecture. And if you have any question, please uh, feel free to email us. Okay, thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye. <laughs>